the short answer, of course, is that I didn't. Like a lot of the best things in life, it happened by accident. When I was an undergraduate student in my first degree, which was chemistry, I had to choose between various possible research projects. And one of them was with my then physical chemistry tutor, who I knew was very good. And it involved Fourier transforms and radio frequency electronics and computing. Those were all things that I'd known something about from uh, interests I'd pursued in secondary school. So I'm afraid I thought, if I do that project, I can carry on being a lazy student. And then I found out that actually research was great fun, and I worked harder than I'd ever worked in my life on it. <laughs> but it was a, just a stroke of enormous good luck to be there at the right time, when multiple pulse NMR was just beginning to blossom, and working for a, a wonderful supervisor. Mm -hmm. Very supportive, uh, very flexible. Well, the first one that worked was, was Dante, and that came, uh, that came about partly by accident. I'd been trying to teach myself about Fourier transfer NMR, about the theory of NMR, and in particular trying to understand the way that the signals we excite depend on what form of excitation we apply. And I'd come to the conclusion that if we were to apply a radiation in the form of short, weak, equally spaced pulses, that we could actually achieve selective excitation. Now, that's now something absolutely routine. We've got much better ways of doing it. But at that stage, it was a very strange thing to want to do, because the whole point about Fourier transform NMR was that it excited all of the frequencies at once. So I'd been um, pursuing this idea for a while, trying to understand, trying to do calculations, and in particular trying to understand the relationship between the nonlinear spin response and the, the engineer's view of NMR, which would be linear system theory. And I, I talked a bit about it to Ray, and he'd been a little bit discouraging, saying, well, you know, the, the NMR response is very nonlinear. I don't know how useful these ideas are. So I, I didn't actually do any experiments until something else that I'd been planning to do suddenly went wrong. And I found myself with about two or three months of time left to finish my undergraduate project and no results and no prospect of any results. So the next day I came into the lab and programmed the whole sequence. It worked beautifully and a few weeks later Ray talked about it at the ENC. So it was very, very quick. And it's always nice when something works first time. That's a little bit like asking which is your favourite child. <laughs> it's a dangerous question to ask. Uh, one, that, one that was special was inept. This came out of writing my doctoral thesis, as part of which I'd done experiments on heteronuclear correlation and everybody had been surprised at how quick these experiments were. These were low, relatively low field, 80 megahertz proton experiments on carbon-13 at natural abundance, and yet we could get good spectra in two or three minutes. And so as part of my thesis, I wrote an analysis of why the sensitivity was good, seeing that one of the effects was the polarization transfer from proton to carbon-13. And it was then obvious that we could get this sensitivity advantage without actually doing a two-dimensional experiment at all. And again, it was an experiment that came very quickly and worked very quickly. And it was something that I, I did on my own um, because uh, Ray was taking a French holiday, which means that you just disappear when the weather's nice. <laughs> so uh, we were on our own in Oxford to, uh, for a month over the summer. And uh, I, I just did this experiment and uh, it gave a nice result, and then when Ray came back, I think I showed it to him and to Howard Hill, and Howard said, oh, that would be nice for nitrogen 15. So we uh, wrote the paper up.
Well, the least successful experiment was almost certainly the one that led to Dante. I, I should explain that, that at that time, Ray had an unusual approach to undergraduate research projects, that when you arrived in his lab, he would normally disappear. And so the student, the newly arrived student, would ask the other members of the group, well, uh, will Dr. Freeman be in soon? And, and we would say, well, you know, he, he may not be around for a week or two. Why don't you just learn how to use the machine and learn a little bit about the area? And after about two weeks, you'd see them realize that Ray wasn't going to turn up until they'd thought of something useful to do. So it, it was a heavy burden in the first few weeks of a project, but it meant that every student that, we came, that, that came through did something original, did something new, and of course Ray was always there to help out and to make sure that they got a good result in the end, but they felt a real sense of ownership of the project. So when I arrived, this was before this policy really got going, um, Ray just said, oh, well, you know, get to learn how to use the machine, see how you get on. And so I went to the library and I worked out a nice project for myself. I was going to build a new piece of equipment, um, a high power radio frequency amplifier, which was designed to do spin locking for measuring T1 rho in a high resolution machine, which is less high power. And the idea was that it would have a power supply which would quickly ramp down the voltage so the RF power would decrease during the spin lock. But that would mean that you start at a high spin lock power, you move down to a low spin lock power at which you can maintain the lock without generating oscillations in the signal. It was a perfectly reasonable idea, and on modern equipment it would work fine. But I uh, built the equipment, and I think it was February the 28th of 1976. I came into the lab late one evening, connected up the equipment, hit the switch to change the timing circuitry from the standard varying one to one that Jeffrey Bodenhausen had made, and the amplifier blew up. And so the next morning, I came in and programmed the Dante experiment, because if that didn't work, I really would have no results. And just one of those lucky chances, a failed experiment pushed me into doing something new, and that turned out to be very useful. I'd say thank you. <laughs> they, they've given me a, a wonderful scientific life over the last 40 years. There's a cliché in English that the one thing that Napoleon asked of his generals was, was that they should yeah. be lucky. I've never met a French person who recognises the quotation, but <laughs> the, the most important thing in science is to be lucky. Also important, of course, is to recognize your luck when you see it. And there have been so many times that, that people have failed to recognize when they've found something important. So be lucky and know when you've been lucky and be grateful. Well, I, I, I should say um, lectures from... Richard Ernst or something like that, but actually the truth is my first conference. This was a NATO Advanced Study Institute and it was being held on the north coast of Sicily in a new hotel in 1976. And I'd spent the summer traveling around Turkey with a friend and then come back overland by train. And I was working my way down Italy, um, Rimini, and, uh, so and various other places. And everywhere I went, I saw posters on the walls that had the name of my hotel and the date of my conference on. But the posters didn't say the NATO Advanced Study Institute on Less Receptive Nuclei. They said La Donna Ideale, the ideal woman. And so you know, I thought, I'm going to get to this conference and find it's been cancelled and this other event has taken over. There was no email in those days so that I would have no way of knowing. In fact, when I got there, I found that it was a big hotel complex, and the two events were running in parallel. And it was a surreal experience. On the one hand, 
you had a bunch of scruffy academics talking about NMR, and on the other hand, you had all these beauty queens and their minders, and swimsuit contests, table laying contests. It was like something out of the 19th century. But it was, a, it, it was enormous fun, and I think most of the people who were at that conference still remember. sense that's a very easy question because the most rapidly expanding fronts of knowledge nowadays are biological. But when we choose research fields what's more important is where we can make a contribution and if everybody is rushing into bioinformatics then maybe there's less opportunity to carve out an individual career. So I don't think that's at all an easy question to answer, and of course most people do answer it in the same way that I did at that stage, which is pretty much at random. Things are governed by chance. Mm. But certainly, uh, certainly biology, the relationship between structure and function, and I'm sure that there are great advances to come in our ability to use computers to explain structure and function. And perhaps from unexpected directions, you just have to look at the success of Google Translate. Decades of work went in to attempting to write logical, structured, intelligent attempts at machine translation. And they were largely unsuccessful. And then somebody came along and just said, well, let's just throw the corpus of translations at a machine and let's see what it comes back with. I'm sure that machine learning has a lot to teach us. Whether we can understand its lessons is a more difficult question, I think. I enjoy music, although I don't have, uh, don't have time to play much anymore. And I try to stay sane by growing vegetables. Oh. So quite often before work I will go and dig potatoes or over the beans or whatever. I would make a real attempt to understand the current NMR manufacturer's technology. When I was a young graduate student, I got to know probably as much about the inside of a CFT20 spectrometer as many of the engineers who worked on it. And for the first 10 or 20 years of my career, I could be fairly confident that I understood pretty much everything that was going on in the spectrometer. But now, there are no circuit diagrams. You frequently can't get access to source code, and in any case, there are very large quantities of code. It's much more difficult to get a real understanding of what is happening. And yet, it's still enormously important, because progress often comes from identifying the limitations of equipment and finding ways to circumvent them. So if I had, I had a year, I think I would probably uh, approach Brooker and say, look, how much are you willing to share with me? I really would like to understand what's going on in my machines to see if I can make them work better. I think if I'm allowed somebody from the past, I, I would take Johann Sebastian Bach. Somebody who, in his music, it, it seems to me, embodies most of the best things about humanity. There's a balance between emotion and intellect, between profundity and playfulness. As experimental scientists, we live with imperfection. That Whenever we do an experiment, we know that it's imperfect, things go wrong, our understanding, our insight is imperfect. And in the music of composers like Bach and Mozart, we, we see at least the possibility of perfection. And I, I find that inspiring. Ah, oh, well, if I knew, I wouldn't be telling. <laughs> Nobody ever got rich predicting the future in Elmar. 
Many years ago, I was invited to visit Varian in Palo Alto, and I actually drove down from the University of British Columbia, I drove down I-5 all the way to Palo Alto, and uh, there was another visitor there at the same time, I think it was Luciano Müller, and they sat us down and asked us, do you think it's worth Varian building a small angle phase shifter for their spectrometers? And we both said, oh, it would be really nice to have that. But I, I guess not many people would use it. Now, of course, this is a standard feature of every spectrometer on every radio frequency channel. One of the beauties of NMR is that it constantly surprises us. And I never know from one year to the next what I'm going to be working on. So, uh, no, I have very little idea of the future of NMR, but I'm modestly confident that it will remain interesting and relevant.